Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Diablo 4. Now, I don't know how closely some of you have been following the development of this game. I know that I myself hadn't really been following it all that closely until we got to the beta weekends, which was the first time that I had a chance to go hands-on with the game. And even then, when I initially went to go and play the game, my thoughts were like, I'm going to play this and I'm going to decide that this is probably not going to be for me because Diablo Immortal was such a massive disappointment, not just the fact that it's a mobile game and it's completely pay to win and it's absolutely disgusting, but just the way in which Blizzard had been handling the Diablo IP left me very disappointed as someone who had been a Diablo fan for the longest time. There's even videos where I heavily criticize what Blizzard had done with the franchise, both in this channel as well as in my secondary channel, and, you know, I hadn't really been following it that closely. But then the beta came out and I was like, it looks like they're actually doing something cool here. I'm still not a big fan of the business model and all that stuff, but I talked about that in previous videos. But anyway, the point is, yesterday they released a video which they called Into the End Game." Now, I haven't really watched this video, so we're going to be watching it, and I'm going to be pausing it whenever I feel like there's something that I want to add. So if you want to watch the, the video, you can go check it out on the official Diablo channel. But in here... I'm going to be watching, I'm going to be reacting, and I'm going to give you guys my opinions on what I think about what they're going to be doing with the end game of Diablo 4. So let's get things started. We're really excited about getting this game into players' hands, letting them experience this massive world. A main cornerstone of D4 is play your way. As the player continues to advance through the story and into the end game, they'll unlock a ton of brand new activities that provide meaningful progression, no matter their play style. Okay, so an interesting thing right from the get-go. Would have been good to see some examples. He just says like, oh, there's going to be tons of activities. Going to get one, going to get two. Like, I know that there's going to be dungeons, and it seems that right now, a majority of the community has been discussing that dungeons are going to be the end game. That's what we're going to be doing. Like there's the capstone dungeons or whatever it is that they're calling them. And those are going to be like one of the primary ways for us to get loot. What other things are there to do when you get to the end game? And, and make no mistake, like when it comes to the end game, I feel like nowadays when it comes to communities, they focus too much on the end game. Like to me, if I play a Diablo 4 game and, you know, let's say that I play it for like 30 hours, 40 hours, something like that. And I get to the end and I was like, you know what, this, is a good, this was a good Diablo game. And I don't touch it again. That's enough for me. I know that different people, they're like, they want to, they're thinking about investing like their 10,000 hours into this game or something like that. And if the game doesn't give them 10,000 hours, then that is, it's going to be a failure in their eyes. I don't look at this game like that. As a matter of fact, I kind of wish that they would go back on the whole needs to be always online, needs to be an MMO, all of that stuff. Because I get it. I get what they're trying to do. I think it's neat to see other players out in the world and whatnot. But to be honest, when I was playing the beta, I didn't really interact with any of those players besides doing the world boss. Besides that, I didn't really need anybody's help. I, I did all the dungeons by myself, did all the bosses by myself. A lot of the world events I did by myself as well. So, you know, besides world bosses, I didn't really need other players for much. So I, it's like, I'm not even saying don't do a multiplayer mode. I'm saying at least include an offline mode because you know that the servers are going to just like explode on launch day because that's always what happens. So, yeah. But um, yeah, anyway, let's let's carry on. Players to be able to keep progressing in the narrative of the game. Alongside that, the whole team has worked on crafting a variety of different experiences players can pursue. We're so we're getting activities, we're getting experiences. <laughs> it's like, look, I'm not saying it's not going to be good. I'm just saying that examples, please. And I know that we're still at the beginning of the game. Now, it's an interesting thing that she said, we're going to keep progressing on a narrative. That's not, I'm not a big fan when Blizzard holds narrative behind some kind of like grind or something. I'm not a big fan of that. Like, look, the narrative, I want it to be complete. I want the, particularly with this game, like through the fact that they had pretty cool cinematics. I talked about that in my video uh, that I talk about in the, in the beta and all that stuff. I love the what they're doing with the cinematics. I love what they're doing with the story of Diablo 4, which is weird i did not expect to be as into the story of diablo 4 as i am because you know ever since 3 i was just like well my standards have like significantly lowered for what the story of the, of the diablo game should be but um 
you know, I'm hoping that it's not like, okay, you finished the game, but you actually didn't finish the game. And now we want you to go do like 20 hours of grind before we unlock the next little tidbit of story. So I'm hoping that's not what they're talking about, but you know, let's see. We're going to have an entire world of sanctuary for our players to offer. There's going to never be an absence of something to do. After the player has finished the campaign, there's a lot more game to go and participate in. They gain access to a special, what we call there a capstone dungeon that they have to complete. Once they're able to finish this capstone dungeon, they're going to gain access to the first world tier. As you complete the world tier, it will open up the opportunity for you to go into your next world tier. That involves unlocking powerful loot, new items, and more advantages for your player to have new items and more. Wait. That involves unlocking. Adventure active veteran recommended for players who desire more challenge level one through 50. Okay, so this this looks like it might be old footage because he just said you're going to unlock the first world tier. No, you're going to unlock world tier three. Because you start at world tier one, you can start at world tier two, assuming that this particular screen is correct because it says here players who desire more challenge levels one through 50. And then when you finish the game, you'll do the capstone dungeon, and then you'll probably unlock world tier three. So that dude was either, you know, maybe was a little bit nervous about doing the, the video or something, but that information <laughs> did not seem correct. Anyways, they're saying that this involves unlocking powerful loot, new items. The one thing that I know about the loot is that the stuff that we saw in the beta was just like legendary and legendary modifiers and the compendium of power and all of these things. But in the final game, when we actually start playing on these higher tiers, we're actually going to be unlocking a new rarity of loot, which are going to be uniques. This is what I've seen in some videos or something. And uniques are basically going to be a lot more powerful than legendaries. So that's going to be the, the items that you're actually going to be shooting for. Powerful loot, new items, and more advantages for your player to have a better opportunity and game. Whether you're a fan of dungeons, PvP, we're just roaming around the world. There's a way to continue your Diablo adventure long after hitting max level. Growing your power. As your character continues to grow in power, you'll start with the skill tree and expand out into the Paragon system. A lot of the choices the players make are grounded on skills themselves and the fantasies associated with those skills. The Paragon board is a place where we're allowed to have a lot more depth, a lot more customization, many more options as you go. You can rotate the board, so you can choose a different path. If you're like, I want to do more strength-based things, or I want these particular boons or glyphs, you can chart your path through it, and they're really a way for you to keep expanding your character. Dude, the stuff that they are showing, let me just mute real quick here. Um, we'll unmute in a second, but the stuff that they are showing for the Paragon board, this is like the first time that I'm paying attention to what the Paragon board is going to be, because this is the first endgame video that I'm watching for Diablo 4. But what they are showing here is not particularly interesting. I mean, just, just look at this. Like, we're going to go frame by frame so that you can actually see this. So, the first thing that they target... Uh, there we go, look. Plus 5 dexterity. Is this the first one? Yeah, it is. The first one was plus 5 dexterity. It's just like flat stats. Is that it? Like, is that really it? Look, flat stats. Five strength. Five intelligence. Actually, let's let's just slow this down. Uh, playback speed, let's put it at like 75. Five intelligence. Five intel okay, no, there's, there's a legendary node there. Let me back away. Cheap shot. You deal 5% increased damage for each nearby enemy that is crowd controlled up to 25%. So basically you're working on these very minor nodes until you get to the legendary nodes. Okay, because I was like, most of the stuff that I was that I was going through the video, because they were going through it so fast, it just looked like, oh, it's just, you know, flat stats. Like, look, dexterity, 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 intelligence. You know, it's not it's not particularly interesting. Uh, things but another thing that you can see there as well is there's glyphs so there's also going to be a glyph system that you're going to be putting in your paragon board which most likely is going to have some sort of an effect i'm not sure how that is going to work out and i'm also very curious as to wait refund cost 53 
53,000 gold to refund one skill. See, this is, this is what I'm talking about. Like, look, for a Diablo game, the respec, I just don't think it's reasonable. I just don't think it's reasonable, particularly because like you're going to be, you're going to be playing a barbarian and you're going to be happy. You're going to be working on a whirlwind build barbarian and you optimize your paragon board to the nth degree to be good for whirlwind barbarian. And then you're going to get like a unique item that is going to give you uh, what, what was it called upheaval. You're going to like a build defining unique item that is around the skill of upheaval. And you're going to go like, Okay, it's time to get a mortgage on my house so that I can afford to respect my goddamn character. No, 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 bro. No, no, no. They need to sort that stuff out. They need to sort that out. Like, no, 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 no. And it's like, this character right now has 4 million. So you might argue like, well, I mean, the character has 4 million. It costs 53,000 to respect. That's not a big deal. Cost 53,000 to respec one skill. One skill. So what happens if it's like, well, I need to respec all these suckers. Let's just say it's 10. Okay, now it's half a million. Oh. Respecing 10 skills, now all of a sudden it's half a million. Those 4 million no longer look that impressive anymore now, do they? So yeah, I, I know that there are some players out there because there, there's people who have been writing comments is like, hey, look, your opinion's valid, whatever. I just fundamentally disagree with the opinion that it's like, not just make a new character. It's like, the hell do you mean just make a new character? Hey, this isn't back in like the 2000s where I remembered that I would just get my friends like, hey, bro, I need some TP rush. Which I don't know if, if how many of you guys remember, but back in the day, the way that you'd do it is you just get a friend and they would just teleport you through everything in normal so that you could then just do your character normal or nightmare. Sometimes they teleport you all the way into hell and basically they'd give you the basic teleports. They would run you through the game. They would just like kill all the bosses for you, do all of the... That's the way we used to do it back in Diablo 2, okay? You'd get a friend, your friend would come over, kill Andariel, get you to Act 2, kill Duriel, get you to Act 3. Uh, actually, in Act 2, you'd also go have, have to go get like to tell Rasha stuff, do all that stuff. After that, go to Act 3, kill Mephisto. After that, go to Act 4, kill Diablo. Go to Act 5, kill Bale. And then go to Nightmare and do it all over again. And then go to Hell and do it all over again. It's like, look, bro, this ain't the 2000s anymore, all right? Just let me respect my character at a reasonable cost. And I believe that Rod Ferguson has said that it is not going to be prohibitively expensive. But the values that I'm seeing here, this is prohibitively expensive. Okay, 53,000 when the character's got 4 million gold. That's not good. That's my opinion, but like respecting needs to be easy to do. It needs to not be a big like a big like, oh no, you've invested into your character, so now we're gonna we're gonna force you to make a new one. It's like, no, that's ridiculous. You can rotate the board, so you can choose a different path. If you're like, I wanna do more strength-based things, or I want these particular boons or glyphs, you can What happens if you rotate the board and there's already skills on it? Or can you not rotate the board if there's skills on it? Do you need to unassign every skill and then you rotate the board? Start your path through it, and they're really a way for you to keep expanding your character and making it uniquely yours. Similar to the Paragon boards is the Codex of Power. It's an in-game system that holds the aspect. So my criticism about the code, I, I said Compendium of Power earlier. I want to say that that's what it said in the thing, but maybe it's Codex of Power. It's whatever. But like uh, my biggest criticism on the Compendium of Power is that the skills that it had in the beta for the class, the ones that I picked up were mostly worthless. Like you can use the Compendium of, of not Compendium, the Codex of Power to make like a legendary transform an item into a legendary sure but the affix was like meh like the lego affixes were pretty good but unfortunately you only get one use out of those so you can like extract them once and apply them to a new item i don't understand the reasoning behind that because like wasn't it in diablo 3 again i didn't play too much seasons in diablo 3 or whatever but wasn't it in diablo 3 you could just like extract the stuff put it into the radric cube or whatever and it would just be there for whenever you want it to apply it to something else like, that would be way better than like, oh no, you get to apply it once. It's like, no, because for instance, with my Necro on the beta, I picked up the, you know, I picked up the, the exploding mist thing. 
I took it out, put it on a weapon, because at the time I wasn't even aware that you couldn't do that more than once. But I pick it out, removed it from the weapon that I got it because it was a pretty weak weapon, put it on a slightly more powerful weapon. My plan was like a little bit later on, I'm going to get an even more powerful weapon, extract that again, put that there. And it's like, no, you can't do that. You can only do that once. And it's like, well, what that does is it kind of like incentivizes players to, oh, I got this really good legendary. I'm going to put it in my in, in my stash and I'm never going to touch it again until I get to max level. Does that seem reasonable? Because because that's going to be, I mean, that if, if you're following like any type of min-max mentality, that would be what you would want to do because you don't want to like put it on like a level 20 item. Why? Because then, you know, you level up from 20 to 30 and now that item is worthless. I, I don't understand. Maybe I'm missing something. Let me know in the comment section down below. But from my opinion, the whole thing that you can only extract it and put it in an item once, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense, personally. Related to the character. You are able to complete a dungeon, and they will have a chance to drop an aspect that you can pick up. And what this allows players to do is take items they're finding in the world and make them more powerful, turn them into legendary items. Here's another thing. She says that when you complete a dungeon, there's a chance of you getting one of these aspects. In the beta, it wasn't a chance. Like, you complete the dungeon, and your reward for completing the dungeon is getting the aspect. Pretty sure that's how it worked. That's weird. It's almost like the stuff that they're saying now doesn't really make a whole lot of sense when you put it side by side with the beta, unless I missed something. It's really special to discover what kind of playstyle really means the most to you. Nightmare dungeons. Every part of Sanctuary is fulfilling and satisfying. Dungeons in particular are really close to my heart. Nightmare Dungeons are going to give the players the opportunity to experience a dungeon that they might have already experienced in their past playthroughs. They'll enter the dungeon with a found sigil that alters the playstyle and the intensity of the dungeon. Okay, so this is like affixes. This is like Mythic Plus Dungeons. I'm cool with that, so long as the, the affixes aren't too asinine. Like, this is the current case in World of Warcraft. Most of the affixes are terribly asinine. I'm like, oh, we're going to put some explosives on the floor and they're going to blow up and uh, people are going to die. I was like, okay, what's the good side of that? There's no good side. People die. Okay. Cool. Like, actually, explosives isn't even that bad. I remember that doing explosives was actually fairly easy. Which ones were the more annoying one? Like, Grievous? The one was like, aha, you took 1% of damage. Time for your healer to blow all of his mana to heal you back up. And if your healer happens to slack just a little bit, you're going to die. Or Sanguine. Dude, Sanguine was the most egregious goddamn thing. Maybe it wasn't the worst, but I freaking hated Sanguine because it's always like you, you already have to position so very specifically. And Anyways, I'm talking about World of Warcraft. It doesn't really matter. It's whatever. But I'm just hoping that they take that experience and they they don't make... The affix is just be, oh, everything's bad. We're just going to make it miserable for you to play through this thing. It's like, uh, okay, not cool. More difficult, and they have additional objectives, and then they also have affixes, which add a degree of difficulty for you and your group to work through. Additional One of my objectives. favorite affixes that you can find in Nightmare Dungeons is actually called Hellgate. Occasionally, these portals will open up throughout the area that will just pour out different monsters that aren't native to that region for you to also be dealing with while you're trying to handle everything else inside the dungeon. There's over 120 dungeons to play through. What's the good aspect of that? We're going to just pour random mobs into the dungeon. Okay, cool. Do I get more rewards for that or... It's like, no, we're just... And the worst part is that he said this is his favorite one. <laughs> It's like, my favorite affix is there, there's this portal that shows up and just spawns random mobs. I was like, okay. Where, where's the good part of that? <laughs> no, it just, just spawns random mobs. Oh, okay. Because <laughs> like, you, I, when I'm going through a dungeon, I barely even notice like, oh, this mob is not from this region. It's more like, oh, I got to kill this mob. It's like, whatever. But I, I can't believe that that's his favorite affix. Ooh, that is rough. ...find in Diablo 4, and any one of them can become a nightmare dungeon by finding a nightmare sigil and then using it to activate the nightmare version of that dungeon space. Okay. Everything's a little darker, everything's more difficult. It's going to add a little bit of a twist of flavor on your particular dungeon. Okay, the darker... Be careful about that, okay? Because th the game does have a thing where it's like, for instance, 
I like having a lot of natural light. You can see that right now there's natural light shining on my face. Problem with that is that when there's natural light, there's a screen. The game starts getting a little bit too dark. You literally can't see what's happening in the game. So I'm hoping they balance that out because there were definitely a few dungeons where I was like, oh, I need to crank up the gamma on this sucker and then all the colors get washed out and stuff like that. So it's very important to have a good balance. Endgame exploration. There's some targeted activities in Diablo 4 that suit what you're feeling in the mood for. The force of hell are starting to have more influence in certain parts of Sanctuary in the vast interconnected overworld of the experience. And as the players are going into Helltide areas, you're gonna find even Hell more tight. powerful monsters. And by killing them, they'll be able to gain these special shards they can take to go and use to purchase these big rewards that are available, these caches that are found literally throughout Helltide areas. The sky darkens and the rivers run red, meteors fall from the sky, and the monsters get harder. We really want to create new experiences for the players. There's one I really like called Whispers of the Dead, which you get from the Tree of Whispers. The Tree of Whispers is grim and a little gruesome, but it's also something mystically haunting and kind of beautiful. The tree has a little bit of a grudge against our players, and it would like for them to go serve its needs. So you're going to go serve these bounties, gather different rewards, different items, and bring them back to the tree in hopes that it can exchange you something really meaningful. Maybe you're gonna go to the Fractured Peaks and take out some werewolves that are rampaging in the town. Adventure They're mode. Contained activities that you can do alone or in a group. We really wanted to create variety for people to be able to spend time where they wanted to in the world. It's very cool the way it's been put together and I can't wait for people to see it, to be honest. Like what she's describing just feels like bounties in adventure mode for Diablo 3, which you could you can already do that. Like right now, you go into adventure mode and you choose, okay, which act do I feel like playing in? I'm going to go to this act and I'm going to do, you know, bounties in this act. And then by the time you're done, you get like a, a chest or something and some gold and some gems and whatnot for completing, I think it was like five bounties or whatever. You get like a chunk of EXP. There you go. Like, but... What she is describing doesn't really explain what is the unique part about it in Diablo 4. It's just like, oh, there's this tree, and the tree is the thing that gives you the rewards. Okay, so you replaced Tyrael with a tree. Okay? <laughs> it's like, it's not particularly... <laughs> Let's just put it like this. And I want people to understand something. I'm, I'm asking these questions, not because I want to be negative about the game, because I already know some people are going to be like, oh, here comes negative Rurikon always being negative. And it's like, no, I want you to understand. I, I was very impressed with what I've seen in the two beta weekends. I was very impressed. And that's the thing. I want to play the game and I want to have fun with the game. And whenever there's something that I see described in this video and I'm like, well, I've seen that in Diablo 3. It's not as special as you're making it out to be. And the way in which you're describing it isn't really showing me anything that is particularly special. That's what I'm trying to convey, okay? I need, I'm trying to understand. I want you to explain to me what is it so special about this Tree of Whispers because what you described was basically a Diablo 3 bounty. Which I guess if somebody's never played Diablo 3, then sure, they'll be like, oh, that, that, sound, that sounds interesting. But if you've played Diablo 3, you're like, that, that's a Diablo 3 bounty. It's like, what's, what's so different about it? I mean, the one thing I guess that was different was that you saw here. Painting. Give me a second. Let me find it. Um, they show here in the rewards, you get like to choose from three different selections and you get a little bit more control with the loot that you get. Like watch quest complete. And then it's going to show, wait, what was the, the reward thing? I saw it somewhere. Festering burrow, and then you complete that. Come on, show it. Show it in the tree. There it is. Choose your reward. Collection of one-handed weapons, collection of boots, collections of gauntlets. So you see, at least it gives you a little bit more control over what you're going to be getting. So that's cool. But other than that, I don't really see anything super special about what they're describing. But let's keep going. Maybe you're going to go to the Fractured Peaks and take out some werewolves that are rampaging in the town. 
their contained activities that you can do alone or in a group. We really wanted to create variety for people to be able to spend time where they wanted to in the world. It's very cool the way it's been put together and I can't wait for people to see it, to be honest. I really want to see it. I want to see what's so different about it. Fields of hatred. In Diablo 4, we have a focus on the world of Sanctuary. And there are parts of that world that we call the fields of hatred, where Lilith's presence in Sanctuary has begun to seep through and manifest these poisonous areas throughout the world. When players go to these regions, they get to engage in player versus player conflict. These offer opportunities for the player to collect shards. But there is a little bit of a catch. In order to get these shards back to town, you will need to purify them. Other players will. How many of you guys played Division? So in Division, there's this thing called the Dark Zone. You go through the Dark Zone, you kill mobs there, you just kill the mobs, they drop special loot, but it's contaminated, and you need to call in a chopper to evacuate your contaminated loot so that you can then get the loot after you leave the, after you leave the, the Dark Zone. The thing about it is when you call in a chopper, other players can see that you called in a chopper and they can go there and mess with you and the, because PvP is enabled in the dark zone. This is pretty much what this sounds like. So she's saying that you go into this area, fields of hatred, it's a PvP zone, and you know, you kill monsters, they drop sweet ass loot, but the loot's contaminated, you need to purify it before you can have it. And while you're in the process of purifying it, other players can come and mess with you and kill you and steal your stuff. That's that's what I'm imagining. Definitely know that you're attempting to purify your shards. So you See, better be prepared is. to fight if you're going to be playing any PvP and be prepared that you might lose some stuff in the meantime. Once they've got the So and and I want people to understand because there's I already know that there's a lot of people in my community that are like, I don't like PvP, I don't I don't mess with PvP, it's not my thing. And it's like this is going to be optional. It's one of the paths of progression. I think it's interesting, personally. I like the concept. But it, again, it's not something that's particularly original. It just feels like they played the division. They were like, "Oh yeah, let's let's make something like the division. We'll call it Fields of Hatred. There's going to be PvP enabled, and people can purify and steal and do all of these things." Usually, what tends to happen with these things are players who work in a group dominate the area, and that's that. Now, I don't know if they're going to allow grouping in there, or if it's going to be always free for all. But even if it's a free for all, you know players can kind of like organize themselves but usually that is what tends to happen like you'll you'll get yourself and you're like oh you're bright eyed and you're ready to go do some pvp and you're like ah oh, yeah i'm gonna go to the fields of hatred it's gonna be a good time and then there's like a team of 10 players there farming everything and the moment they even look at you they'll murder you just by looking at you that's usually how it goes in, in these types of scenarios. I don't know what systems they're going to put in place to kind of like prevent that. And I'm assuming that because this video is six minutes long, they're not really going into much in-depth information in regards to the fields of hatred. Although I would love to like interview one of the developers, but I don't think that Blizzard's going to give me the time of day <laughs> to interview anybody from the Diablo 4 team. But if they do, hey Blizzard, open door, man. We'll do a cons cast. It'll be a great time. Purified shards, they can take these, go back to nearby towns to sell them, and then use that to buy a whole bunch of like interesting cosmetic items and rewards. It's a place for people who really love PvP and want to still get loot and still increase their character's power. If that's a way. And the other problem with PvP, by the way, that I should point out, particularly if you're somebody who's new to Blizzard games or anything like that, let me tell you something, okay? Historically, Blizzard class balancing, especially when it comes to PvP, it's, uh, what was the, th the saying? Some, somebody once told me in a Blizzard forum that the way that Blizzard balances their classes is they have like a scale and they drop a piano on one side of the scale and then they drop an anvil on the other side and they just hope that it evens out. That, that's Blizzard balancing for you. Like, I just put a piano in here, put an anvil in there. Did that work out? Uh, no. Turns out the anvil was a little bit heavier. Okay. Let's try dropping another piano on the other side and see how that evens out. Yeah, the balancing has been historically atrocious uh, in most Blizzard games. I guess probably the most balanced one might have been StarCraft. Maybe. I don't know. I don't know, but like, I can tell you that in terms of World of Warcraft, oof, 
In terms of like Diablo 2, ooh, oof. Ooh, in terms of Diablo 3, well, it's not even good. It didn't even have PvP. I think it had PvP briefly, but yeah, it was pretty bad. So yeah, I don't have high hopes for PvP. I think it'll be fun for the first couple of weeks. Once the meta establishes, it's basically going to be either play this class or don't even bother showing up for the PvP. They, they want to play, they can. Launch is just the beginning. One of the things we're really focused on is creating a living, breathing set of updates for players to engage with after the game has gone live. It's really just going to be a way to keep coming back and experiencing more Diablo 4 in fresh ways. We're really eager to hear all of your experiences and just enjoy the entire story with you all. Okay. So here's my thoughts on this video now that we've seen everything, I've given you guys my commentary, all of that good stuff. Number one, and especially, I mean, not number one, but like, I'm not, not going to go by any sort of order, but because we just recently talked about PvP, one of the things that I would like to bring up is the fact that because players usually, whenever they want to talk about pay to win, what is pay to win, what is not pay to win, they always like to bring it up. Well, if, it's, if it doesn't have PvP, it can't be pay to win, which is something I fundamentally disagree with from the moment that you can pay real money to advance your character in any conceivable way. And, you know, that to me is pay to win. Doesn't matter if it's against other players, doesn't matter if it's against enemies. If you can pay money to skip something that somebody else has to spend a bunch of time doing in game in order to catch up to the fact that you paid money for, uh, that to me is pay to win. But, you know, people feel free to stretch the, the goal posts however the hell they want or shorten the goal posts however the hell they want, which is something that I usually tend to see whenever the pay to win discussion comes around but that is my definition so that is the definition by which i operate but anyways uh with this having the thing of the field of hatred do remember that basically if you do not get the digital deluxe edition that you are going to be four days behind in terms of progression from somebody who has been playing for four days if you jump into one of these field of hatred things if that's not pay to win I don't know into how many into how many folds people are gonna go and they're gonna fold themselves into a goddamn pretzel to be like, nah, it's it's not pay to win, bro. Okay, because they're gonna say like, oh, but the season only begins like two weeks and this doesn't matter. Oh, so it doesn't matter that you're getting blown away by people that had four days head start in the PvP zone. Whatever, bro. Whatever is your definition, but like that right there is like a good explanation. But anyways, now in regards to the rest of the video, here's the one thing that I have to say. I am not convinced by their plans for Endgame. I'm not convinced that it is going to be something that is going to hook me, but to be honest, it doesn't have to, because what I'm interested in is just playing through the story at this point, because you know, season passes and all of that stuff and the ridiculous amount of monetization that the game's got going for it. I don't know if I'm going to engage in Endgame or not. I can tell you that this video was not the video that I was going like, oh my God, they have this thing? Oh my God, this is amazing. Nah, not really. And by the way, I'd love to be proven wrong. I would love to have a, a more interesting conversation with, you know, a developer, community manager, whatever, somebody from Blizzard who knows more about this than I do. I would love that. I think that would be interesting. I'd love to do a cons cast around that. Because, you know, you have a video like this that's designed around catching people's attention for six minutes and whatever. I would prefer to have a longer conversation where I can really dive in. Okay, you said a bunch of activities. Give me like three of them. Three activities. What's special about these three activities? You talked about the Tree of Whispers. Okay, Tree of Whispers to me just sounded like bounties from Diablo 3. What's so different about what the Tree of Whispers is doing versus what is happening in Diablo 3? You know, that type of stuff. I would love to get much more in depth. And this video was just very superficial. So it didn't really convince me of much. Uh, but, you know, we'll see when the game comes out because I am going to be playing it. I will be playing it here on the channel. So hopefully you guys are looking forward to that. Uh, for now, this is going to be it. If you guys enjoyed this video, do remember you can hit the like button, subscribe, all the bell notification icon, all that jazz. And I do have a couple of more Diablo videos coming up to the channel. I think uh, we're probably going to be doing couple of cons casts that are going to be somewhat focused on Diablo 4. So hopefully if you guys are looking forward to Diablo 4, you'll stick around, subscribe for that stuff. And yeah, that's going to be it for now. I'll see you guys in the next one. Stay strong, stay safe. Peace out.